Welcome to the Creator Forge podcast, where we try to answer the question, what forges great artists? By interviewing professional artists and other creators about what they do, how they got there, and what advice they have for industry hopefuls. I'm Jeremiah Clark. And I'm Pat Bolin. And I'm their guest, Marty Walker, Senior Animator and Technical Director at Bentobox Animation Studios in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Marty. Thank you so much for being here today. I can't tell you how excited I am to have somebody from Bentobox here. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to have you specifically here too, of Not course. Not a problem at um, all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but the reason I say Bento Box specifically is because I don't know much about Bento Box. And I really have never met anybody who works for them, actually. And that's saying something because the creative... Uh, uh, the creative community in Atlanta is so connected mm -hmm. uh, that I know someone from just about everything else I can name here. Yeah. 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 That's so, interesting. And to be clear, it's not like Bento box is a little tiny, you know, hole in the wall studio. I mean, most people, if you know anything, you know, Bob's burgers, but they also do tons of other things for, for, but dozens of networks. I mean, yeah. on the website, the list is quite impressive. So right, it's not right, like right. it's just a little, you know, little indie shop or something. Mm -hmm. And so Bento Box, of course, is an animation house. Yes, it's right. uh, an animation house. The Atlanta branch, we mostly, um, we've done a couple series. We did uh, The Awesomes for Hulu, um, which is the superhero show. Um, we just wrapped on uh, Legends of Chamberlain Heights for Comedy Central. But a lot of what we do between those projects is like pilots and uh, smaller shorts that, um, or like, animation for pitches we hope to get off the ground so a lot of the work kind of ends up not really being released but so it kind of fluctuates between uh a big studio that employs like 100 people and sometimes we like go down to like you know a really small crew just to like get a pilot done or something so that's why you know it's it's a big studio but the atlanta branch kind of goes in and out and i imagine if you talk to a lot of people from floyd or even like primal screen some of them have like you know, worked at Bento for like a couple months and then like gone off. So, yeah. Okay, um, cool. So they did start in L.A. Yes. Uh, the original branch is in L.A. and they started the Atlanta branch in 2012 mm -hmm. um, for a show for IFC called Out There, mm -hmm. which we did a season of. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I was like probably the third or fourth wave of people hired there. Um, and what year was that? That was 2012. I think they opened in June and I started in like September. I don't know. It feels like it's been very recent, just like a couple of years since I started seeing all the industry press releases about hiring in Atlanta for Bento Box. Yeah. And yet 2012. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's been a while. I mean, it's flown by for like thinking about that as like five years seems like way longer than it feels like because it feels like just yesterday I was like an in-betweener, mm -hmm. you know, working on out there with like my first studio gig. You know, mm -hmm. that brings us to what do you do for Bento Box? Uh, I wear a lot of hats around the studio. Um, I'm not sure what my official title is, but um, <laughs> the the, uh, the last couple of projects I've been acting as technical director, which means that I do basically they come to me with a style that they want to achieve, whether it's like a fully rendered painted characters or like a flat lineless thing or like this kind of cartoony. Uh, and I develop the rigs and the sort of pipeline to get it done and also do some experimental animation that I can show the director and say, like, are you happy with how this looked like if the show looked like this? Is that good? Or, you know, this is going to have to be a little bit more cut out, a little bit more puppety than hand drawn. Uh, are you happy with how these joints kind of work and move like, you know? So um, it's either that or if we have a fully hand drawn project, I do a lot of um uh the hand drawn animation there and cool sort very of cool some of the so it it sounds like in a lot of ways you're the you're the first step post concept at, of making something real uh of like we have this concept we have this look we want now figure out how to make it happen for real is yeah that, I, is that um, fair uh yeah so basically uh what my role boils down to uh with the last couple projects is that uh they come to me with like a visual concept for a show and i give them ideas of how to execute that concept and how to yeah so everything doesn't just look like you know the same show being made over and over again um because you know that's something i've always been really excited about with animation it's just like stylistic variety so it's a really cool position to be in at the studio yeah well and that is one of the strengths of animation is you can make so many different looks and it can you know without having to i don't know go crazy with costumes or special effects because it's it's all it's all it's all created it's all invented 
reality. Right. Exactly. It's basically like the exciting thing about it is like, if you can draw it, you can animate it. Cause that's literally the only thing that goes into it. So it's like any style that's ever been drawn is technically animatable, whether it's practical under like a real budget, you know, that's another question, but right. you know, it is possible. So you're not necessarily the guy who's deciding there what, what exact style that you're going for, but you're the guy that they're going to to kind of develop what's on their mind for a particular project is that what you're getting at uh yeah basically and you Um, are still doing animation too yeah and i'm also still doing animation so yeah um i do like test scenes and i also if it's if we have a hand-drawn project there's normally not like a lot of technical work that needs to be done so okay wait hand-drawn now yes some some of the things that we talked about earlier, of course, uh, as we always do, uh, we went out to lunch before this and we chatted about some of this stuff uh, in advance. So uh, you were talking about um, the fact that there is often a separate department that's doing kind of the illustrations or digital paintings. And then they hand that stuff over to the riggers who mm-hmm. rig it up in tune boom harmony. Yes. Unlike uh, Floyd County, which is uh, doing most of the rigging and animation in after effects, Adobe after effects, right. Toon boom can do similar things, although it can also do, and we'll, we'll ask you this question in a, in a little bit. I know that it can also do a lot more mm-hmm. and, and in a different way, but then uh, after rigging, it goes on to, an animator who takes the rig and brings the images to life. Now that is a description of what I think of as limited animation, which Mm -hmm. is of course what they do at Floyd County for Archer and things like that. But you guys also are doing full blown traditional hand drawn drawing for drawing frame for frame animation. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. Um, to get more specific than limited animation, I would describe what Floyd does and what we do for some of our, um, projects as cutout animation, which mm-hmm. is to say it's sort of a digital version of that stop motion technique where it's a character that's all like how the first couple seasons of South Park were done, where they were like puppets. literally cut out. They were puppets like that are just moving puppets. around. Yeah. Um, what we do with our, what we call our hand drawn thing is we will use some cutout techniques for like, you know, maybe a torso just needs to be rotated, but you know, all of the arms and legs are fully hand drawn frame for frame. So it's a sort of a mixed approach where we try to lean. The goal is for it to look as hand drawn as possible, but if there's a couple tricks you can use to kind of help you, then like absolutely go for it. Cause we have a deadline. Right. Um, and you know, a lot of these shows like, you know, Bob's burgers and are a lot of talking head stuff. And for that, you know, we have a rig with a face and mouth pack that you can just, you know, you get it in a nice pose and you do the lip sync and you know you draw it from pose to pose. But, um, a lot of the hand drawn animation is also, I would call limited animation in that, um, sometimes it's just for the project. It's like, you know, we want this to be like an old hand Barbera thing where it's, it's limited animation in that, you know, it's very pose oriented where we get to a pose, we stay in that pose and then, and they know, talk or something. Exactly. And right. they move when they need to, um, it only when they need to and there's not a lot of like extraneous like disney stuff so it's not like uh, like it's not like the camera is spinning around the the character or something basically right. a hand will move uh you know uh, an arm will move a head might move side right. to side and then the mouth will move but basically for like, the scene is still for that moment exactly yeah. and that's for like you know maybe 80 percent of the project and then there might be like 20 percent that's like a big fight scene or a big dance scene or a big like jumping kicking flipping scene and that's like all just we'll just draw it because it's faster to really well it's um it's not faster but it will look better Mm -hmm. if we dedicate the time needed to drawing than trying to get a rig Mm-hmm. to do that rather than r- rather than forcing a puppet exactly right yeah okay and you know there's a lot of developments in puppets these days where they can do like incredible things but there's like a, a sort of there's a point of diminishing returns where the puppet has to be so complex that harmony can barely function anymore <laughs> so it's like you know this is it's easier to wrap your head around if it's just a drawing mm-hmm. you know and yeah. I see, you know, Chris Bivens, who we've had on the show, I, I watch him work and, and he works in Toon Boom sometimes. And I know that he, he does similar things where he'll rig what he can rig mm-hmm. and then he'll just draw what he has to draw when it's more complex and there's yeah. heavier movement. So, 
So that kind of answers what you currently yeah. do with Bento Box. Mm-hmm. Are there projects that you can talk about at Bento Box specifically that you've been specifically excited about, uh, or that you're? Is there something that you're working on even now that that you're allowed to talk about that's not in NDA right now that you're excited about? Most of the stuff I do a Bento because we do a lot of the pilot development is under NDA that I can't really mm-hmm. discuss. Uh, the one, the biggest thing we're working on right now is. Um, this project for NBC that was based on an SNL skit called uh, David S. Pumpkins. It's okay. like a Halloween special. Uh, I haven't really worked on it. I'm just doing one of the, they've got this like sort of dance number that's at the beginning that I'm kind of helping animate uh, right now. But other than that, um, yeah, it should be fun. It's one of our sort of hand-drawn, more hand-drawn kind of projects where we try to keep the movement really simple, but um, a lot of, what we try to stay away from is for movement looking too digital. So when we get a project like this, it's, uh, yeah, it's back to the, back to the drawing board. Good. Good. (laughs) I like that. I I mean, I, but I like hearing that. I I like hearing, okay, well, we're still allowing artists to be artists and, and it's not all on the shoulders of software. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, not to say that, uh, software is doing everything, right? Uh, You still have to have an artist driving that software or it's like, it's like, uh, well, up until relatively recently, there was no such thing as a self-driving car. You still have to have a person driving it. They still haven't perfected it enough to, to be out on the road. It's, you know, it's going to be a long time, I think, before for computers are doing um, satisfying art and animation that, mm-hmm. that will actually appeal to a, a mass audience. Uh, and I hope that that's no time soon. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the bottom line is, is I, I'm always looking for opportunities to get back into a sketchbook or draw or paint. And I imagine that an animator is probably uh, often trying to find that feeling again as well. Yeah, so. it's nice. It's an interesting trade off because, you know, the schedules sometimes a little bit nicer with the cutout shows, but you know, uh, with the hand drawn shows, you know, you get to draw. So it's like, you know, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, since, since you're doing a lot of the, um, the, the more practical execution end mm-hmm. of things, do you have much input or part in the concept and design process? Uh, or do they kind of come to you and say, just make it work? So not usually it's, um, I've done concept for like one or two projects, but, um, a lot of the times it'll basically be this director, um, will come up to me and be like, you know, we're trying to go for this look. What can we do? And then I'll say, we can't do that. And then it'll be like, (laughs) okay. And then the next day I'll be like, oh wait, no, I thought of something. And that's sort of our like working relationship. And then I'll come up with something. I'll be like, all right, we can do this, but here are the rules. And it'll be like, cool, cool. And follow those rules up until about episode three. (laughs) <laughs> once you know we're comfortable with it and then we start to break it but by then you know we're comfortable enough that like we as a team have come up with enough solutions that we can start can to you tell me what you mean grow. by uh, come up with certain rules like what kind of rules um we were recently working on a project um i can't talk too much about it but it had sort of really complex like rendered characters where for the sake of the schedule that we had we could only have like one view of the character um, and we were trying to do as get away with as much like cut out animation as possible just so we wouldn't have to like repaint an entire arm. Oh, yeah. Because that's a little bit more involved than redrawing an entire arm. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of those rules are like, hey, they're not allowed to turn their heads. They're not allowed to, you know. Hey, could we avoid them sitting down? Because, you know, I've got the legs working pretty well, but I don't know how this is going to look if it's sitting down. And then it's always like, uh, gotcha. But eventually they'll get to a point where they'll, they'll write a gag or a, a thing that requires somebody to turn away or. Yeah, say yeah. And it's like, and it's always for this, for the service of making it better. And it's like, well, this is a story point and this is necessary. So we have to figure this out now. Sure. You know, um, or yeah. Or it's like, we had this rendering on like an arm that if you bent it too far, then we would start to get uh crashing in the textures where you would be able to see like visual spikes Mm -hmm. in like the rendered texture so i was just like well try to only have them act like this uh (laughs) he's doing a a stiff arm Uh, yeah basically like Uh, a stiff arm (laughs) like you can get about 93 degrees of rotation and they're not allowed to sort of point their thumbs at themselves because that would be bending the arm right no foreshortening allowed and then you've got to you've got to manage all these so-called rules and still make it look somewhat normal to the eye yeah, yeah yeah 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Make it look as much as possible. Like, like there aren't rules. Like, yeah. Yeah. You don't want people awkwardly like me and they like, don't really right. point at themselves because their arms are moving. Like they're, you know, like a fifties robot monster <laughs> yeah. movie thing where they just didn't bend their arms. And that's of course, what, that's what know, robots do. To, to, especially I would think to uh, younger students who are listening to this, they're going to be like, what the heck? Yeah. No. And it's it, a lot of it is about budget and about deadline and about time. And, Often, I'm, I'm sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I discover often that those limitations will breed creativity. Yeah. You'll try mm -hmm. and find ways within this set of rules to almost break them, you know, it's that, just, just to have more fun with it. That's actually one of the exciting things about um, that project and others like it is that uh, as an animator, because I animated a couple scenes in that project as well, while there was like downtime on the technical end. And when your character, there's a lot of things that the rig can do and there's things that it's not allowed to do. And the things it's not allowed to do are generally bad acting choices anyway. Ah. So it, f by not being allowed to go to your go-to, like whatever his hand is just out while he's talking, you have to actually think of a better acting choice. And I think mm -hmm. I'm actually really proud of a lot of the character animation that's come out of like that project and like others with those limitations, because it's like seeing the way we worked around them and the creative choices that like everybody on the team came up with is actually like, it's a way cooler thing nice. than just like, um, you know, it if, requires you to think more. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That just reminds me, I know it's a different thing, but with, uh, actors, you know, like most people, if they're just standing casually talking, they're going to, you know, fold their arms or, or put their hands in their pockets. That tends to look really bad, especially if it's a dramatic scene. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll find something to do with their hands. And it's like, forces you to think, well, what would this character do if they're not allowed to put their hands in their pockets? Yeah. So similar thing, although that's live acting, but I mean, it's just cause it doesn't look good on camera. Right. Yeah. So exactly. you, you have to be more creative than just do what you would normally do. Yeah. 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 Not only that, but my understanding is technically speaking, there can be some challenges with putting hands in pockets in <laughs> yeah, animation. Well, oh, yeah. well that might've been <laughs> yeah. the best animation example. <laughs> right. Um, I know in uh, uh, Troll Hunters is something uh, I've been thinking about lately. You and I talked about this, not yeah. uh, not on Creator Forge, but we talked about this uh, off mic about how on um, Troll Hunters, I think, honestly, it, it was probably all about budget and deadline where it didn't seem to me like I saw them put their hands in their pockets even once, even when you know that there was something in their pocket that they had to retrieve, <laughs> they would either turn away from the camera yeah. or they'd reach like they'd be facing the camera and the thing that you know is in their back pocket, they'd reach behind themselves and then just pull out whatever it is. But you never once actually saw them put their hands in their pockets, yeah. which I mean, this may sound like uh, harping on something so minor, but it was just so interesting to me me that they they found creative ways to keep their hands out of their pockets <laughs> because it probably costs a lot of money to create the mesh in 3d oh, to yeah. make that happen oh, yeah, no, yeah. Cl uh, cloth in 3d is ridiculous right. um, okay no this is totally off topic but and it's a little bit old now but the uh, the incredibles mm. when um mr incredible pulls out his old costume and it has a hole in it and he sticks his finger through the hole and wiggles it uh-huh that scene was a technical triumph like nobody had ever done that before in high quality 3d really and it's like this most this minor thing you never think about. Oh, you just put a hole in the six fingers through it. The cloth physics did not like it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and like they never really had to deal with the problem of solving that until yeah, yeah. until Brad Brothers like, look, this is come on, we have to do this. And they're like, all right, well, I guess let's figure this out. Well, there's a reason and that's you know. one of the first uh, 3D films they did that had human characters who changed clothes. Right. Because the right. clothes were actually separate part. I mean, anyway, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's funny. It's again, this is you know we're talking high budget you know 3d right, right. versus limited television animation but mm -hmm. it all comes down to the same thing is um there are technical challenges that you can get through if you can just throw money at it but well, you, yeah but if you can't and, right. and or, time. You know, or, or time yeah. Yeah. money time or both then you have to find creative ways around it and of course that's one reason why a lot, all the early movies were about toys or animals or bugs or mm -hmm. they don't wear clothes they don't have pockets mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or hair or whatever so now um, we're talking way too much about 3D stuff here when yeah. you're a, t uh, a 2D uh, animator. So is there an analogous to that in 2D? Is it also challenging in 2D to uh, put a hand in a pocket or something like that? Uh, the advantage of 2D is that when all else fails, you can just draw it. Mm -hmm. So putting a hand in a pocket, like I can do a drawing of a guy with a hand in his pocket. And if the rig won't get me there, then I can just make whatever layers mm -hmm. I need to and just draw right. the hand in the pocket different set of challenges exactly there's a different set of challenges um 
Well, but, I imagine it all comes down to that that final D, you know, the because three D versus two D. Yeah, you know, the the advantage of two D is that you like you can just draw, you can you can fake it so much easier. Yeah, yeah, but you can't fake things like you know three D. You can just turn the character. Yeah, you have them twist their head. You two D. That's all new drawings or new, right. or, a, or a super complicated rig or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, coming up with ways to do like little head, head tilts and stuff like that, uh, which adds a lot more than you would expect um is i would think one of the bigger challenges Mm -hmm. uh working with 2d especially with like rigs where we normally have like a five point character turn and then a lot of the shots we need like a little eighth view between the front and three quarter and like you know so it's a matter of do we include that in the design process or uh does the animator just have to add one and then make it available for the other gotcha. animators so um, definitely well, a different set of challenges yeah. yeah and then that's what makes a lot of this stuff so interesting is when, once you learn about that you just watch like i know once i learned about that you watch animated shows and you get really impressed because like wow they just they just pulled that off and yeah. i know there's you know this is limited animation or you know yeah or they like this one scene you can tell they've saved like you know, Archer will, for example, will mm-hmm. do like, cause just cause that's such an action oriented show or is it because most of it is characters standing around talking at each right. other. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then we'll have one scene where it's like crazy action and you know that they spent all their time and money on that scene. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure, uh, without talking too much out of school, um, a lot of their more animation heavy stuff, they've been slowly transitioning to Toon boom. So, um, because I don't even know how you would pull off some of the action stuff in like After Effects. Yeah. But yeah. Or even um, just to go to simpler show, one, one that, you know, Ben Tabak show like Bob's Burgers, which, yeah, yeah. which I watch religiously. Yeah. Uh, you, again, if you watch that show, it looks great and you mm-hmm. can't tell where the break happens between here's the normal rig and here's something special. But you know, there are scenes where it has to have happened because they'll do every couple episodes, they'll do like some crazy thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. I was trying to explain Bob's Burgers to uh, Pat earlier. Who, <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of it. it's yeah. kind of outside of his what he normally watches. And I was like, well, there's a lot of music. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, I don't know how to explain this show, but but yeah, that's true. All the all the like random dancing and music and yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'll definitely have to go and watch that now. Yeah. So so was there anything else that you wanted to add it to like was, what, what you're what you and I guess uh, you with Bento Box are currently doing? Uh, that's pretty much it or all i can okay uh, you know you you mentioned it <laughs> yeah you mentioned it earlier uh but i am curious as to how many people actually work in house at the atlanta based uh, bento box location uh it depends on the project uh if we have a big show we'll uh normally have like 70 to 100 people ish mm-hmm. um but every now and again it'll be like we'll have a big project uh with 70 or so people and then uh, the next project will be so small that we'll only have like 10 or 12 people on. So I would say we have like a core team of about 20 people and then we kind of add on, we kind of inflate and deflate as we need for the, I see. Yeah. And, and so, and I, I assume as people come on for these larger projects, they understand this is a contract temporary position, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's a project to project type right. of a thing. Yeah. And it, while, people are on for say a six month contract, let's just say Mm -hmm. six months, nine months, whatever it's going to be. Are they full time with Bento during that time with benefits or, uh, or are they part time or just contractors like subcontractors or something? Uh, I'd say 90% of the time they're full time. Okay. Um, and every now and again, like if we really just need someone for two weeks, they'll just be freelance. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But most of the time Bento's really good about like giving people benefits and all that stuff. And you know, yeah. Rock on the yeah. more, uh, the more of these types of jobs that are available in Atlanta, which it's, it's getting more and more and more. I mean, uh, I heard yeah. the expression Yollywood, which is, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I like that or not, but it's, it's a, it's a wink and a nod towards uh, y'all, y'all, you know, yeah. and Hollywood. I, I just like to say that we're becoming the Hollywood of the South or we have been for quite some time actually. And, um, and I'd like to see more and more studios bringing more and more work here because of course, not everybody wants to live in LA, right? Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, but not everybody wants to live in LA and, and a lot of people here, there's an incredible group of talent right here in Atlanta that want to stay right here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think the more that that's recognized by companies that do things like what Bento Box does uh, and brings more and more jobs here, I think that we're going to see even more 
big projects coming here and things like that. And uh, anyway, it, I think it's, 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 it's good all around. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're it's doing our small part to we're doing uh, our shed small some light part. on that. <laughs> yeah. You know, we didn't intend to be the uh, creator forge of Atlanta. Right. You know, uh, or the Atlanta creator forge. But, um, but for now it kind of has been that. And we, we did that intentionally a, because this is where we live and we care about it. And we do want to shine that light on what's happening here creatively and also because uh, I like being able to have lunch with my guests and, <laughs> and seeing them face to face and, and shake hands and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, we are certainly already discussing the possibility of uh, bringing guests on from around the country, if not around the world. But it, that's we put out one podcast a month. That's that's a slow burn for right now. So uh, yeah. I'm I'm always very excited to hear about this sort of thing happening here. It's one mm -hmm. of the reasons I was really excited to talk about you as well because we just haven't known anybody else who's <laughs> who's worked, worked over them. at Bento Box. Yeah, and, yeah. And, well, and uh, it's true as we keep digging, we we haven't run out of people yet. Oh, or, God. or studios. There there's still a half a dozen companies I could name off the top of my head that we haven't talked to anyone from. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and of course, uh, plenty more to go. we didn't even talk about this. We, we usually do at the very beginning on, uh, how, like what the connection is in this case. We, I have no uh, idea. <laughs> there, there was none. Oh, okay. Um, I was actually just looking around at companies on LinkedIn that oh, okay. I know, uh, are here in Atlanta or have a studio here in Atlanta. And I was just reaching out to people who looked interesting to me on LinkedIn. Oh, so, and, well, uh, and you were one of those. So nice. Good. Um, so this is the first day that we've ever met. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike uh, some of the people that we've had on here have been like, oh, I've known you for eight years. Right. And you're the, yeah. you know, you're the lead, whatever at, uh, at Floyd County. <laughs> or, or even <laughs> you know? people we work with or work with. Or people that we have worked with or currently work with. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but we want to uh, widen the net to, mm -hmm. you know, not just our core group of friends who right. happen to be creatives, which is a great group and right. uh, we hope to eventually get around to you know actually interviewing every last one of them but uh, again once a month uh there's only so many interviews <laughs> that you could fit into yeah. a year um so but eventually uh if we uh start getting um more numbers of course uh, maybe we'll be able to you know get uh get one out per week or something like that and, and eventually get uh, more and more interviews uh, with uh, creative professionals right here in Atlanta, if not around the country. So, and then there's another case of it being a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a time crunch, a, a time limitation. Right. We mm -hmm. just, it's a matter of time to to do all these interviews and do all right. that while we're trying right. to do other things. But, but that's the hope. That's the hope. And didn't want to get too far off track there. So, um, no, too late. <laughs> <laughs> so what we typically do, um, once we've gotten kind of past what you're currently doing is mm -hmm. we go back and say, okay, well, how did you get there? And okay. so we'll start with, where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from, uh, I say DC, but it's actually Bowie, Maryland, which is right outside of DC. You're mm -hmm. one of the few people who recognized it as a been there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm from there originally, born and raised. Were, and you, were you someone who drew a lot, or did, did you get into other things? Like some people, uh, I don't know how old you are. Mm. Oh, I'm 28. 28? 28. 28. Okay, so you're you're young enough to be part of that first wave that didn't maybe even start out drawing with a pencil. You may have started out drawing with a, a, you know, a graphics tablet of some kind or something like that in a program. Uh, is that the case for you or did you start out the old fashioned way with a good old fashioned yellow number two pencil? Yeah. I mean, obviously like when I was like a kid, kid, I mostly drew on paper mm -hmm. cause you know, I didn't really have a computer until I was in high school Okay, or a personal computer. Uh, but yeah, uh, a lot of me learning animation was when I was like 14, a friend of mine had a copy of, uh, Macromedia flash MX Macromedia. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we would just play around on that. Um, so I was kind of introduced to like cut out animation and motion tweens and sort of software before I was really um, any good at the drawing part. So, um, yeah, a lot of my high school was like animating in Flash and drawing mm -hmm. in a sketchbook and all that. I've what was your initial um, inspiration? I mean, did you did you watch a lot of animation? Was it, you know, Saturday morning cartoons or was it feature length stuff in the theater? A lot of it was, um, I watched a lot of cartoons growing up. Um, I think I grew up, my grandparents had like these old VHSs of like Fleischer cartoons, like the old Fleischer Superman oh, wow. from like the forties and like Popeye and stuff. And, um, so like nostalgically, like those like forties shorts are always, 
um, really cool, man. Yeah, uh, this is the first time that somebody on our show has gone uh, back that far oh, really? with, with their inspirations. Yeah, yeah I mean, great. The Little Whirlwind, which is a Disney short from like 41, um, which featured that mm-hmm. really awesome Mickey Mouse design that Freddie Moore did, where his ears actually made sense in 3D space, is one of the only things that like when I watch actually has like a hard nostalgic resonance. So a lot of it was uh, watching that uh, Disney movies from like the early nineties. And then I distinctly remember watching the show Garfield and friends at one point and (laughs) John Arbuckle on that show is a cartoonist, which to me was the first time it signaled that like, Oh, someone's job is making cartoons. And I didn't think like, obviously cartoonist is like newspaper cartoonist, just drawing cartoons. But I was like, Oh, animation. Right. And that's when, you know, I started doing them in like a, post-it note animation nice and then got into flash in high school and uh when i got into college is when i really learned how to draw i'm sorry did you answer the question whether or not your parents were uh supportive uh yeah they were really supportive awesome Um, they always supported me drawing and yeah my dad uh helped me out getting like equipment and software when i started freelancing when i was in college you're not an only child are you i'm not an only child How how many siblings do you have i have um Four. You know, it's not good when you have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you have four it's siblings. I have four natural siblings and four step siblings. Okay, big family. Ooh, yeah, and and were any of the rest of them creative types? Uh, we were all. I would say everyone is somewhat creative. Like they can all draw. Like a lot of when I was a kid was me drawing with my brother during church. Mm-hmm. Um, we would have like Dragon Ball Z cards that we would just copy the drawings off of. Right. Um but in church yeah in church (laughs) you know you gotta pass the time somehow um yeah so me and my older sister are the only ones in creative fields she's a a sound engineer for like broadway shows in new york and i'm an animator in new atlanta and everyone else is a lawyer accountant and And you went to the art institute of washington yes okay uh which is in northern virginia Okay, so and DC, uh, not the state. tell us a little bit about that experience. How did you get in? Did you get in with any kind of scholarship? <laughs> um, how we, okay, you're laughing. How did I get in? How I just I, applied. How did you pick it? I, um, how did you pick it? That's, that's an important question. I, I was, imagine there's a lot of, isn't there? I mean, there's a lot of education yeah. opportunities around that area. Yeah. That is true. I uh, was privileged enough to have a graphic design class in my high school where an AIW rep came and if we filled out a card saying we were interested, we got a pencil and I needed a pencil that day. (laughs) And so I filled out the card and then I went there (laughs) and that's my, that's my story. So you you didn't look at any other art schools? I looked at them, but I, uh, I was lazy. I didn't, (laughs) it was overwhelming. And I was like, well, I'm already like in this school. So, ah, and then it just, just felt like the, I just, I, yeah, I just kind of drifted into it. Okay. So, so, a, <laughs> so what happened to the pencil? Uh, I still, I had it all the way through college. And, I was going to say, uh, keep yeah, that yeah, pencil. This yeah. is your fault. Yeah, this is your fault. God damn, every time we make a loan payment. God damn. Pencil. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I don't want to get into the loan conversation <laughs> right this second, but that, that might be. Far too depressing. Yeah. Uh, well, it might be something we should talk about on this show. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I think that people should be very well aware of what they're getting into when they go off to school, uh, to an art school. Yeah. We well, just sum it up with college is expensive. Think long and hard about whether you actually want to go. Well, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've seen this analogy before, yeah. um, and I know we're, we're totally coming, uh, right. uh, we're coming off the subject of Marty, right, but, yeah. uh, but forgive me. I mean, it's, it is important. I, I'm still fairly loaded with uh, college debt. And I, I've seen this analogy before, which is you can come out of art school, not always do, but you can come out of art school with as much debt as a doctor does. I have a lot of friends who came out with like 150,000. Yeah. Yeah. For like, and wanted to be like comic book inkers. Right. And you know, there's obviously a, yeah, I, I always give the recommendation that not that people don't go because I went twice Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I still say that I had a great experience. Um, but, um, that debt does affect my daily life. And so I, I always give people the recommendation that if they can't get some type of full scholarship or at least a, 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 a good size partial scholarship or fellowship, that they need to think long and hard about whether or not this is a ride they want to take. Right. And you if know. you take that ride, because like, I think the biggest value that you get out of art school is um, 
is the networking opportunity. Like every job I've ever gotten was through a friend recommendation. I've never gotten a job by like cold emailing a company right. before. So um, just like any school, everyone's experience seems to be that they get exactly what they put into it. Right. Whereas like, you know, we had 10 week classes and there's only so much that a teacher can really cover. So they're kind of that, just crash courses. That is true. Uh, yeah. 10 weeks or 11 weeks is the standard quarter system as opposed to a semester system. Yeah. So earlier you were uh, uh, prior to the recording of this, you were telling us uh, a little bit about how your animation education went at the Art Institute of Washington. Are you I I willing and interested yeah. in sharing uh, some of what you shared with us earlier? Yeah. Um, AIW was interesting. Like the professors were all really passionate and really great, but the, we didn't get a lot of support from like corporate um, in terms of like curriculum. The curriculum was sort of designed to like turn over as many students and like get high grades so that they could show everyone like, Oh, look at our graduation rate. We're great. Um, and a lot of what I learned was actually outside of class or in between classes, like researching like blogs and other things, online resources and books. And my senior year, um, actually, I think my last couple of years there, I sort of looked at the animation mentors, um, curriculum and designed my own, little like animation thing and just sort of did all of my classes as independent studies. I told him my idea for the assignment list for the quarter and then he would sign off on it or give his opinions. And then basically once a week I would show him my progress and then he would grade me and you know, he would give notes and all that stuff. So a lot of it was very like self-driven, um, self-driven education. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, under those circumstances were the professors helping in any way i mean so okay yeah. you 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 brought the okay you brought this assignment this designed assignment that you designed mm -hmm. and came up with were they still able to help guide you through that assignment in any way yeah um so basically they were sort of acting as like the mentor on animation mentor right. where um i would be like you know this is my like advanced acting for 2d animation course where i'll do two like 11 second club uh clips mm -hmm. and i'll just animate that and then you know i would show them my thumbnails and they would give me you know ideas on acting and then i nice. would you know rough it out and then they would so at that point still being in school it was still beneficial it's i mean because one of the things you hear a lot is oh i could do this at home but it sounds like you were still getting at least some value out of having an animation people right there or or does it feel like that was maybe not worth it yes you can do everything at home but to be the type of person that could sit in their basement with no outside influence and um and get all of the value out of it like having the structure of school is helpful and having because you you don't know what you don't know and you know the professors at least know, know how to yeah they know <laughs> yeah they know it so, so it sounds like they the, can open your eyes to concepts that you haven't even thought of it sounds like even though that you found the curriculum overall to be slightly deficient so you had to look for a curriculum outside of that school at that time being in school and being exposed to mentors and professors was still extremely valuable there was a lot of information and networking possibilities there that that you found of value that have still helped you to this day right exactly okay. yeah and honestly like networking like i started freelancing while i was in school in my like sophomore year because a professor came up to me and said, hey, I was at an animation event and met a guy who was looking for uh, animators. Here's the, he came up to uh, me and a friend and I emailed the guy. And then that's when I got my first jobs working on like PBS Kids commercials. And so wow. I had this nice like dual education where everything I did in school was like paper and pencil, hand drawn animation. And at the same time, I was freelancing working on learning flash and cut out animation and the business end of how to write a contract, how to sign a contract, how to send an invoice. So I was able to get like a really well-rounded education by both being in school and freelancing. And when I graduated, I graduated with two years of experience sort of under my belt, which gave me Rock a little on. bit of a head start. That's huge. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that, I had a lot sounds... of really great opportunities like, starting out. Perfect setup.
Yeah. Like, if, like if you could just make that happen for everyone, that would be ideal. Exactly. Exactly. Because like the business end is just as important to learn as the... If you weren't showing so much interest in your own education, though, that professor never would have come to you with exactly. that opportunity. So that's that's yeah. uh, that's a huge takeaway that I want any uh, student or potential student listening to this podcast to to take. And, and that is that you, you really do have to be self-driven. There is no such thing as a spoon-fed education or a spoon-fed career. If you think you're going to go in, walk away with a sheepskin, which, you know, uh, it, by the way, that means a degree, oh, um, you know, I was wondering um, too. yeah, it's no, it's an old <laughs> fashioned saying. Uh, if you're going to, if you think you're going to walk out of there with a degree that uh, you skated by with C's for, and, and you're just going to automatically get a career, it doesn't work like that. And it's not just in art, it's in every field. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So you, you were already doing freelance when you were in school. So after you graduated, did you, did you keep up with that or did you, you know, did that help you find a job or, or what happened then? Uh, yeah, it was basically, so I kept up with the freelance that I had been doing for the first like six months, which was a lot of interstitials for PBS kids, a lot of sort of cat in the hat jumping out like, hey, we'll be right back after these messages kind of stuff, which was really cool work because it was like, you know, I was working with, you know, assets and characters that were on TV shows. So it was like I worked on, you know, Cat in the Hat and Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, but I didn't really. I just worked with those characters for their sort of supplemental material, which was a really nice like training ground for like when I got to an actual studio to work on the actual show. Um, I sort of had experience working with those studios without having to get hired by them with zero experience. Um, and I freelanced around. I did a lot of sort of graphic design work um, just because it's a little easier to get and when you're freelancing full-time you kind of take what you can get especially that early on i um did the world wildlife fund commissioned me for like a a video uh on overfishing in the coral triangle that i animated for them and what were you doing to get these clients mostly there was a local networking event called like the animators roundtable or something that was meeting once a month where you'd go uh someone would do a presentation and then you would exchange the business cards i was I worked on this uh, Android game with a friend that was like a little platformer game that um, I did a presentation on the animation for for that game at the um, at the uh, networking event. And, you know, so it was a lot of kind of putting myself out there that way. A lot of it was just from, you know, friends of friends who like got jobs at studios uh, who like needed people. Uh, a lot of the graphic design work I uh, when I was younger, I worked at this. Uh, nonprofit that like taught kids how to like play instruments and i did a lot of the graphic design work while i was there as part of my job and so um my boss there would recommend me for graphic design work to like her other nonprofit friends uh and my school uh one of the great things they did was they put on a convention every year called gigacon gigacon gigabyte okay yeah so they would put on this convention where they would bring in industry professionals to do like portfolio reviews and workshops. Uh, and a lot of my early like super professional, like people who had like worked in the industry for like years, um, contacts came from that. And it was literally one of them called me up and said, Hey, I've got some friends in Atlanta who are starting up a branch of Bento. Do you want me to send them your stuff? And I was like, sure. And then, uh, I, that's how I got Bento. And then I moved to Atlanta and I worked, uh, in Atlanta at Bento for like two or three years, uh, on out there. And then the awesomes, which is a show on Hulu, uh, as well as a couple pilots. And then I got a job in Vancouver, uh, as a lead on, um, this show for Netflix called Dawn of the Crudes. Um, hold on. How long were you with Bento box before you went to Canada? Uh, I'd say, I think, 2012 to 2014. So two okay, years. So you were, you yeah. were with them for two years yeah. and then you got the opportunity in Canada. Was it a situation where you had a contract that was ending with Bento box and you were looking for something else as a result of that? Or were you just looking for something different to do at the time? What was it? Uh, basically um, after season two of the awesomes work kind of dried up in Atlanta as a whole. Um, and a bunch of us got laid off. Um, I was one of them and I had a freelance gig that would have carried me through the end of the year. It was like a three month thing. That was a really cool project. And, uh, just during that time off, uh, one guy who worked at Bento who was Canadian just moved back up to Vancouver 
uh, to work at Bardell, uh, which is the studio I worked at. And then he just recommended a bunch of us. And there was this sort of mass exodus where like 10 or 12 of us moved up to Vancouver to work on. Some people worked on like Rick and Morty and I was on the, uh, the crudes. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, you know, the crudes, if, if people don't remember you, you, you told us that earlier as uh, if like nobody knew what the crudes was or oh, something, I but know. I'm like, I, I love that film. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would be really excited to work on something like that. Yeah. So. It was a really cool project and it was my first time as like a supervisor. So I was mm-hmm. a lead animator on it. And, and you said that that was supposed to last three years when we talked about it, uh, prior to the recording. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you ended up only being there for about eight months. Mm-hmm. And, and the only reason I'm bringing that up is not to, you know, stab at a, at a, at an old wound or something, <laughs> but just to kind of make clear how some of these things go to our younger audience. So do you mind talking about like, why would something yeah. like, it's not like you got canned or something. I mean, right. it's just that the project came to an end, right? Right. And, and how did the project come to an end? Um, basically, so it was supposed to be three years initially because that's sort of the blessing of Netflix is Netflix just orders three seasons of a project or of a show, uh, off the bat and they don't really care about ratings. They just want content. So you can get longer sustained work, uh, nowadays. Um, the issue was, um, I had moved up there and this was the second studio, I believe that the project had gone to and they were kind of behind schedule, uh, when I started and just through like management and directing and like, you know, trying to figure out what the show's supposed to look like while we're making it. Um, we just ended up so far behind schedule that DreamWorks kind of pulled the plug on us. Um, they got, you know, a new showrunner and just decided to start clean. And so they basically, um, rather than doing the whole series, we just finished the episodes that we had already started. And then, um, the rest of the show was going to go to a different studio. Um, so, and I, they offered me, um, like other work, like that studio has like no shortage of work, but, um, I just decided that, uh, I wanted to kind of move on. And then I ended up just going back to Bento cause they, they had been emailing me and kind of wanted me to come back. And okay. so yeah. they'd been, they'd been contacting you yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah. So this is absolutely irrelevant, but oh, yeah. it came to mind. I'm going to ask the question anyway. And I, I know that being able to just jump out of the U S and go work in Canada, there are hurdles. Yeah. How hard was it for you to get the permission of the Canadian government to go up there and work for a Canadian company? So, uh, the first time I had ever heard the word NAFTA before our current political climate where everyone cares about it all of a sudden. Right. Um, it, I went up on a NAFTA visa, which, uh, basically just meant I needed proof of employment letters from basically every client proving that I had three to five years of experience. Having gathered all of the paperwork, I landed in Canada and then left the airport with a visa and then started wow. work on Sunday <laughs> or on Monday. That's bananas. So yeah. the company didn't even have to lead you through a visa process or anything. I, they sort of did, but, um, yeah, I didn't have to fill out any paperwork or anything. Holy cow. I just, I had a letter that said he has a job and I had the, experience if i didn't have the experience it would have been i had some friends who didn't have the three to five years experience and they had to like go through a much longer so process. Yeah, all you had to prove is that you had enough experience to make you a genuine value to the company and yeah. to, and probably I was to, a to the economy or wherever yeah. right whatever the i like said that's interesting man those canadians they're yeah. uh they're <laughs> trusting well that's uh that's actually <laughs> nafta it's like uh it's basically an agreement between the u.s canada and mexico that says like we're oh, allowed yeah. to exchange uh, professionals, right? As long as they can prove that they're, you know, right. worth it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, um, it was a really cool experience. Like, it was a really amazing city to live in, and I got to meet a lot of really cool people. My team was like super international. Like, I had two girls from France who went to. Uh, I learned how to pronounce it, Goblin or Goblins, as probably a lot of Americans say it. That like French uh school that puts out those amazing shorts. Um, they were on my team. I had, you know, a guy from London, a girl from Russia, Hong Kong. And then the sort of blessing of everything kind of exploding and everyone kind of going back home is that now I have kind of contacts and friends like all over the world in the industry. Very cool. Yeah. So that leaves us with, um, you know, just kind of where you're at now. Are you still doing any kind of freelance work? Uh, every now and again, uh, I'll get a project. Um, 
that comes by either through a friend or just I had one of the best projects I ever had was someone randomly found me on LinkedIn. And that was when I was like, oh, LinkedIn, this is some worthless thing. And I just kind of accept <laughs> literally everybody who <laughs> offers me an accept. And then like I ended up getting like one of the best freelance gigs I've ever had off of it. Um, and then you got to be on the show. And then I got too. to be on this show. Wow. So, you know, yeah. LinkedIn. <laughs> um, yeah. So every now and again, uh, if we have a project at Bento, that's like really light where uh, we're at ahead of schedule and everything's going amazing. I'll like take a freelance gig and cool. I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I get to kind of pick and choose. So I do freelance gigs. If it's a project I'm really excited about, not, you know, mm-hmm. awesome. Awesome. So, so that kind of brings us to the, the end of what we typically do on uh, this show. But I mean, do you have anything else that you'd like to talk about? That's uh, just really exciting to you right now. That's happening in the industry or that's happening in education or anything like that. I mean, this is like, I always say this is like a really cool time to be in animation just because of like the stylistic variety that's out there where like, there's a lot of shows that look different, right? Just because, you know, you know, I worked on like the show story bots, which is like a Netflix show, which is this really cool. It's done by jib jab who made those e-cards and does a lot of like web shorts. So they're kind of throwing all of their collective knowledge over the years at the show. That's like this really cool mixed media kind of thing where like some of it's 3d some of it's 2d some of it's live action and it's kind of all thrown together um there's a lot more sort of that like gumball or these kind yeah. of like mixed media shows that i think is nice. always it really is, exciting it is, now that you mentioned it, it is very experimental time in animation isn't yeah. It? yeah yeah especially like with commercial work and with like you know netflix and things like that they're exactly. throwing money at, at at new content Exactly. Exactly. And even like the shows that like DreamWorks is putting out, like their Peabody and Sherman show, like looks super fun. Like they're throwing a lot at like the design end of things. Whereas, you know, I mean, you look at like the eighties and, um, that stuff where everything kind of all looks the same and right. You know, because it was uh, a limitation. Yeah. Well, there was limitations, but it was also, this is what sells. Right. Exactly. Right. As where I think people are starting to understand that you don't always know what sells exactly now you know it, it's kind of an anything goes time frame that's true mm-hmm. in fashion it's true in design yeah you know well yeah well it, plus a lot of the stuff in the 80s was specifically to sell action figures and there was a very particular oh, type they, of action figure. they still want to do that oh no they still want to sell <laughs> merchandise but it's not specifically you know um muscle bound characters who punch each other action figures that they're trying to sell and that's it mm-hmm. you know because so I mean, there was a while there where everything looked like, you know, He-Man or Thundercats or, you know, yes. whatever. You can tell that time period. Now it's like, you know, you take, um, you know, Bob's Burgers, Archer, Gumball, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Rick and Morty, uh, Steven Universe. You know, there, there's no, there's almost nothing similar between them except they're, they're all animation, but they all have their very distinct styles. Yeah. And I think it's because they're, well, I mean, I guess one theory would be that they're selling a lot more than just toys now. Yeah. They're. You know, they're making money on, well, like you said, some of this is just, they want more content. Right. Just to yeah. Get people like in Netflix because- makes money on subscriptions and that's all they need. And, uh, or I don't know if they make money, you hear a lot. Well, they, you know, I, I don't know if they're making money or not, but yes, the, <laughs> the, I think the model is that, you know, anybody can get a contract to have, a, uh, you know, a particular feature film on on their channel and also on hulu and also somewhere else the idea is that like orange is the new black and i think troll hunters and things like this they want to have their own private stuff that's Mm -hmm. coming out that only their people or or sorry their members can actually access and and i i mean honestly that is one of the reasons why i keep netflix myself yeah yeah is there's that like one exclusive show well there's a few on netflix that i just really like well and and that's true of netflix hulu uh amazon Amazon. yeah uh well it's always been true of hbo uh you know Mm -hmm. it's at least since they started doing tv well i'm sorry it's not tv it's hbo (laughs) but the point of this is though is that there's a lot of really interesting content out there no matter what creative field you're in Mm -hmm. which is which is which is in our wheelhouse. Yes. Yeah. That if you're a creator of any type right now is a really exciting time because the, the, the variety is blossoming and these companies like Netflix and Hulu that are less, less ratings oriented that just want to do interesting creative things and see what sticks. Right. Yeah. And right. like the independent market is really great. Like we live at this time where there's like this free distribution channel that you can like just make stuff and just put it out there and, you know, try to get a following and you, you know. can also do that with things like podcasts. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> podcast, you know, all this like, yeah. I mean, hey. just, just really the, it, it's a creator's world right now. It's, it's about finding the time and the passion and the money in mm-hmm. some cases to, yep. to do it, which is all difficult. We, we certainly found out for ourselves, uh, creating this, but you know, all of this is actually a perfect segue to ask you for what we always ask at the end of the show, which is what kind of advice do you have for anybody who also wants to be a industry hopeful <laughs> who wants to be an industry or who hopeful. wants to be an yeah, animator yeah. a professional amateur i think you a just are an industry <laughs> hopeful if you want yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um i mean in the getting a job part it's all about you know putting yourself out there and like meeting people and also you have to become undeniable uh if you're at a point where like no matter what people say about you they can't say that you're bad at this then you'll never be short on work mm-hmm. you know as, um, as long as you know people who are willing to to help you out, I mean that that's yeah. really it, you we, have to be like a good person too. This is this is <laughs> such a huge theme. I mean, we've done this is what going to be episode seventeen. This yeah. yes, this will be our anniversary show. Oh, so, it, so it'll be it'll not be our twelfth show, but it will be our anniversary show because it's releasing in November. And uh, and there's been a massive theme, uh, several that have come through this podcast, and one of them is yes, you have to be great. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter how great you are. If people don't know you're great at it, you have to put yourself out there and you have to be someone that, uh, people could see themselves working with. Yeah. Um, and you also have to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's okay to take breaks. I know there's an industry that kind of praises workaholism, workaholism, (laughs) um, where, you know, there's a lot of people wearing their all nighters on their sleeve, like, you know, badges of honor. But oh, this is an interesting conversation to me. I am a firm believer in uh, saying no to working a weekend and saying I need to sleep. Actually, I, you know, need to spend time with my girlfriend. I need to uh, recharge. Yeah, I need to have a life outside of this because burning yourself out is just your work is going to get worse and you're going to be miserable and it's not good for anyone. Um, you know, clean your kitchen. It's probably really dirty. You should just <laughs> clean your kitchen. Honestly, it's not that you don't have time to clean it because you need to draw. It's that you don't have time to draw right now because you need to clean your kitchen and you need nice. to prioritize like. This is something yeah. I, I, I've seen articles about I yeah. mean, and not just in our industry, but in others as well, especially in the entrepreneurial uh, um, mm-hmm. um, circles where you, you, they're just like you said, they're wearing their all nighters on their sleeve, like a badge of honor mm-hmm. and more and more I'm seeing CEOs starting to come out and write articles that said, yeah, but you know what? I actually became way more productive when I started putting my foot down and getting eight hours of sleep. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't, I've been, you know, lucky enough that I've maybe pulled one. I've, Stayed up until 4 a.m. like once in my like seven years of working, including school. So like, you know, 11 years. So it's uh, it's about knowing you're like, no one will blame you for having limits. Mm-hmm. They'll blame you for not knowing what they are and then oh, that's not a, delivering on your promises. That's a that's, that's a, pull quote. a that's a pull quote no, right yeah. there. I yeah. stole that from someone. <laughs> I don't care, man. I'm, I'm going to quote you and say it came from you. Yeah. That is that, that that's so that's that's so great and so true that yeah. that if you if you don't first of all you you've got to know not just what your limits are. You've got to be willing and confident enough to say no. Right. That that's a part that uh, uh that's a part of the equation that w- without being able to do that without being able to not just say no in a rude way, but without being able to say to a potential client, I'm sorry, I know that I can't do my best work or competent work in the deadline that you are requiring. Right. Can we work on a deadline together that can work for both of us? Mm-hmm. And if not, I, I, maybe I'll recommend somebody I know who's a little faster. Uh, maybe maybe right. their work is different, but maybe, you know, I don't want to say worse right. because different. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes you, for example, I'm an, I'm more of an illustrator. I'm a 2D mm-hmm. guy. I, I work in games and animation, but I mean, the, the work that I produce is static. So yeah. uh, often if somebody wanted something from me way faster than what I could produce, I, I would recommend somebody that I knew who did something a little bit more stripped down, but was still badass. Right. Yeah. It's about like, I think uh, Patrick Smith, who's like an independent animator, always recommends having 
you have like your sort of gold standard style, which is like, if you give me all the time in the world, I can make it look like this. But I also have this, which is a little bit faster for me to produce. Right. You know, it's not Disney, but it still looks good. Um, you know, so you have those sort of two styles to go to or two working techniques to go right. to. Like if I'm freelancing and I have all the time in the world, I can do a hand drawn thing. But if I don't, I can do a cutout thing and make it look just as good. Awesome. Um, it's also that conversation kind of comes up a lot, uh, negotiating notes with a client. Like sometimes they'll come back to you with a lot of notes and then I'll say, well, it's due on Friday. Um, so what are your priority notes and what are your sort of CBBs? You're like, could be betters where if I have time I can get to polishing it. But how often have you had to educate your clients about what the difference is? Uh, I haven't. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. That's I've, nice. So I've lucky. a very charmed career where I, the only time I've had to do that was they kind of came to me with that, where they were like, uh, our goal is to get this done. It was an animation studio and they, um, so they kind of understood the yeah. workflow and they were sort of commissioning me to do all the animation on this piece. And they were like, well, we know that this is the deadline and we know that you're like moonlighting on this. So here's our priority notes. This is your action list. We have all these other things we'd like you to get to, but let's focus on getting this done first and then we'll take it from there. See how much time that gives you. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but, but like but, Jeremiah was just saying, you've been a little lucky because yeah, that's, that's actually a rare thing. I, I often, even with corporate clients that are used to dealing with illustration, I did after a little while start kind of coming up with a, a slightly more stripped down style myself. Mm -hmm. And I would present that as, okay, price difference slash time difference. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. If you want something by tomorrow, I can do it at this level for this price. Mm -hmm. um, if you want it in a week, you know, I can do something at this level. It is a higher price. Right. You know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I'd say that ability to explain what you do and why and what impact it has is something that a lot of artists probably don't develop as much as they should before they get into an actual work environment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't. Right. Uh, but I, even in my, my current job, it's, you know, my day job, I, I work for, you know, they're, they're most of them are engineers or project managers on construction site, things like that. So they're not art people and almost invariably the, they'll come back with changes of things they think will be quick and easy are the things that aren't and mm -hmm. the things they, they think will be like, oh, are you sure you can do this? I'm like, I'll have it done in an hour. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it's not because they just, they just don't know. And, and they do listen, but it's like, I've had to develop yet another way of talking to people who are not in creative fields at all about how, how I do what I do. Cause most of my prior experience of still dealing with people who are at least, you know, illustrators or programmers or whatever. But it's it's a it's an important skill to develop is how do you tell someone who has no artistic background why something's gonna cost take this amount of time and cost this much and you know all that. It's actually like an interesting skill that you can develop like as or I've personally found by actually making friends with not all artists. Like yeah. there was definitely a time where I was in the cult of animation and everyone I knew was an artist and you know <laughs> the cult of animation yeah and it's like you where you can't have a conversation with anyone that isn't about animation and when you're in that mindset having a client who's not artistically is uh inclined is significantly harder to um deal with just because you're not used to explaining what you do to someone who doesn't already know right what <laughs> To someone who doesn't know what the word render means, you right. know, like, or in the context of animation. Right. Um, I, I find that conversations with my, with, uh, my parents tend to keep me grounded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Having to explain to my mother that what I was showing her was a render that didn't exist in reality because <laughs> she thought I was making models when I was showing her renders. And I was like, you know, I mean, she was impressed. She means well, but it's right. like, how, yeah. do I, how do I explain this? No, this does not exist. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you know, they explain their job to you and I'm just as clueless about what they do and how they fill a day doing oh, that. Yeah. And She's an accountant. Yeah. Or was an accountant. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, it gives you the shivers. So is there any other uh, particular advice that you have for um, people who either want to go into school uh, to become an artist or people who are maybe already in school and trying to figure out, Oh my God, what am I going to do when I get out? You know, uh, if you're looking for a school, I would understand that it's, I think no matter what school you go to, it's going to be a self-driven thing. Every, prof everyone I know who is a professor says that their classes are generally like 10% people who care and, you know, 90% people who are there to try to get the grade. 
I don't know if that's true. He made a face. So, oh, okay. No, it's, it's because I just had a conversation with, um, uh, somebody else who's actually just gone back to school. Oh yeah. He's somebody who's been an, I'll, I'll give him a shout out. Mike Valancourt, who is the art director for privateer press has gone back to school, uh, because he's kind of thinking about possibly becoming a professor himself someday. Mm. Um, but he's got a 20 year long career in art and art direction. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. He said he, now he's, he's being able to skip some of the entry level classes because of course, a lot of schools will allow you to do that with a, with the right portfolio. Right. But he's still in, you know, 102, 103 level classes and just kind of, blown like mind blown at the students who you know will often like you say like Mm -hmm. 10% of the class might give a crap and 10% you know and and so on and so forth I think he actually had some slightly more favorable numbers but he was still just floored at how many students who are paying good money Mm -hmm. to come here and get an education to do something that they say that they want to do for a living who aren't not just not putting their best foot forward, aren't doing anything at all. And I found as a professor that, um, well, first of all, as a student, I found that to be the case and mm-hmm. I was floored by yep. it. And yep. then yeah. as a professor, um, which I'm, I'm now actually teaching a class at the art Institute of Atlanta. And so is Jeremiah this quarter, uh, his See first, from the other side, yeah, mm-hmm. his first class as a professor, he's teaching, um, modeling. So what's it called again? Environmental modeling, environmental specifically modeling, for games, right? And uh, and I'm teaching a storytelling class for animation and game art, and um, and this quarter uh, so far, fantastic. Oh, yeah. I, I've been blown away. I mean, it's only been uh, this will be the third week. Everybody seems super engaged. They seem to be absorbing the information and so forth. But uh, honestly, I will I will say that now. Obviously, if you have <clears throat> if you have a good professor, right. uh, they they can they can pull the best out of a student, but. I'm sorry if somebody's just not interested in the class or if they've got a beef with the school in general, which happens. Yeah. There's, there's, there's only so much, there's professor only so much that a professor can do. And you know? I feel like professors have enough on their plate that, you know, they can't, <laughs> they right. can't be the savior to every student who doesn't care. But getting back to your original point, it was don't be in the percentage of the class who's not taking it seriously, right. basically, because yeah. it is self-driven yeah. to a large extent. You will get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. And uh, on a networking note, like if you're at a point or if you do like meet an industry professional, that's like doing what you want to do and you get their contact information. Uh, normally they're pretty cool about if you email them, especially if you email them with like an animation or a drawing that want to critique, they'll be busy and they might not get back to you right away. But, um, that's sorry. You shouldn't be afraid to reach out to whatever contacts you can get because that's how you get into the industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you just, if you get a business card and then sit on it and never email them, then you didn't actually make that contact. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't know. That was, that might've been a non sequitur, but <laughs> no, yeah, it, it makes sense. It, it's the bottom line is, is it's once you make the connection, work the connection. Yeah. Um, and, and as we said in our last episode, work that connection, but work it in a polite human way. Exactly. Um, but make, make certain that you reach out and, and keep the connection alive. Yeah. Yeah. W- one piece of advice I get, uh, experts, they like to talk about what they do mm-hmm. and odds are most of the people in their lives, are sick of hearing about it unless they're also experts in that. Right. Right. So along comes this person who genuinely wants to know everything they have to say about this thing and is, is genuinely interested. I say, Oh boy, I get to, I get to just like, you know, unload all of this, all these thoughts and opinions and knowledge <laughs> on this person who wants it instead of, you know, my poor spouse or, you know, parents or kids or whatever who right. don't want to hear about, I don't care if it's animated on two, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So don't be afraid to reach out to people that you think might actually be unreachable. Yeah. 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 And, and just, and like you're saying, be polite, be, be genuinely interested, be genuine. And more often than you'd think they'll, they'll respond. Awesome. Kind. Yeah. All right. Well, that about covers it. Uh, Marty, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been, uh, been a very interesting kind of all over the place conversation, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, if uh, you wanted to give us feedback, uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We're at all those places as Creator Forge. Uh, please leave a review on iTunes. It helps other people to find us, uh, helps with our iTunes ranking, and just lets us know how we're doing. So good or bad, please just, just review us. And you can find uh, all of our content and links to all of our social media and all that at creatorforge.com. 
yeah, thank you very much. And um, by all means, please do give us the feedback. Uh, that is the best way that you can currently support us. And I'll tell you what, what we'd love to, to hear from you guys out there too is what kinds of questions have we not yet asked our guests that you just are dying to hear as a uh, industry hopeful, <laughs> I yeah. think is what we've been calling it for this episode. Anyway, thanks a lot, guys, and see you next month. 